Good morning. It's great to be with you today. And let's pray. Lord, we ask that you would speak to us now. Speak to us by your Spirit. Speak to us from your Word and speak to us about your world. For Jesus' sake. Amen. So my subject today is caring for God's wounded world. Looking at the whole issue of climate justice and at caring for our creation. If we can look at the next slide. This year is going to be a, a really big year in terms of climate. It was meant to be last year. There was meant to be a huge meeting in November last year in Glasgow, but because of the coronavirus pandemic, it's been postponed to November this year, which gives us time to prepare. And there's one other advantage. It means that America will now be rejoining the climate talks because President Trump had withdrawn them, but President Biden, as his very first act, has decided to bring America back on board. And this year is important for another reason too, if we can have the next slide. And that is that we in the church, we particularly in the Church of England, have made a commitment that within the next nine years, we're going to try and get to net zero. That means that our carbon emissions are aiming to be neutral within the next 10 years as a church. That's a decision taken not by bishops from up on high, but by the members, elected members of the church's general synod, the Church of England's parliament. It's a huge and ambitious target. We don't even know if it's achievable, but it's certainly something to aim for. And these two big things that are happening at the moment give us a bit of a problem. If we can have the next slide, this shows a sort of graph of what happens when you're dealing with something that requires a lot of radical change. You get the innovators and the early adopters, those people who have already recognized that we're in a climate crisis and we need to do something urgent. But then most people are in that kind of big hump in the middle, the early majority and the late majority. And those are the folks we need to get on board to make changes that are gonna be rapid, are gonna be uncomfortable, and in some ways are gonna be threatening for all of us. If we're going to be able to tackle climate change, we're going to need to make those changes. But you know, alongside that problem, if we can have the next slide, I think we are also in a time of exceptional opportunity. This cartoon came out during the first lockdown. It's a couple, one saying, when this is all over, what do you think should change? And the other one saying, everything. This past year has given us a time to rethink what's really important, to rethink our values. Our government made huge changes overnight back when we entered lockdown. Suddenly billions of pounds that the government had previously said weren't available for spending became available in order to help people be furloughed and to get us through this crisis. And we need to recognize that the crisis that's coming and that's already here with climate change is just as big, if not bigger. And my next slide is perhaps a slightly surprising one. It's a book from Pope Francis that's recently come out called Let Us Dream. And in that book, he talks about something called Kairos time. In the Bible, there are two words for time. There's ordinary time, chronos, minutes, hours, days, months, and years. And then there's kairos, which is when God intervenes in a dramatic way. And he's suggesting, and I agree, that this is a kairos time. A time for us to see, a time to choose, and a time to act. And I'm gonna use those three points to shape the rest of this talk. So what is it that we need to see? The next slide shows a cartoon that uh, went quite viral during last year. It's a cartoon of human society being overwhelmed by the two massive waves of COVID-19 and then the economic crisis, the recession that has followed on its heels. And as that cartoon went viral, people started adapting it online and adding other waves. And eventually the cartoonist agreed with that. And he came up with this version that shows not just COVID and the recession, but also overwhelming those, looming up in their wake, the climate crisis and biodiversity collapse, the collapse of life on earth. This is a time for us to see, 
and connect all these things. And the next slide just kind of illustrates the things we need to connect. Because that tiny virus, COVID-19, of course originated in nature, in wildlife. We're not sure exactly how it transmitted to us, but we know from science that pandemics like this, that earlier illnesses like Ebola and AIDS and SARS have all crossed over to human beings because of our mistreatment of ecosystems, because of our destruction of forests, because our, of our abuse of animals. And so this pandemic is linked to the other crises we face. Between the first service and this service, I received a message from a friend in Australia saying, pray for South Australia. We are facing bushfires like we've never had before. And those bushfires, droughts in other parts of the world, hurricanes and typhoons, a climate crisis, an agriculture crisis, a biodiversity crisis, they are all deeply linked. And what's the link? It's us. All of these are human-caused crises. Our greed, our selfishness have caused these. And so as we connect these crises, we need to turn to Scripture. And my next slide, I'm going to spend a little moment on because it kind of gives an overview of God's purposes from the start to completion. And these are five great interventions that God makes in the biblical drama. And the first one we heard in our first reading, creation. God intervenes in delight and joy in making a world of variety and beauty, making something as wonderful as snowflakes, making extraordinary wildlife. And God looks at all that he has made, we heard, and it was all very good. But then, of course, we mess it up. We spoil it. And God's second intervention comes in covenant when he comes to a broken and messed up world, both in judgment and in salvation. And the story of Noah, which is the first covenant in the Bible, is a surprising one. Because just who gets saved? Very few people. But God seems a bit passionate about biodiversity conservation. And then he makes his covenant in the sign of the rainbow. It was a beautiful rainbow just the other day. I don't know if you saw it. And that rainbow is a sign of God's covenant with you and your descendants, that's people, and every living creature on the earth. It's repeated over and over again. And then we get the decisive intervention. God sends his own son, Jesus, into our world to put right the mess that we've made. And he comes for us so that we can be forgiven. But he also comes because God so loved the world. In John 3, 16, the word that's used is cosmos. And Jesus' death and resurrection are not just so we can be reconciled to God, but we're told in Colossians 1, so that all things in heaven and on earth might be reconciled to God. And then we move to church. You might think, well, what's climate change got to do with church? Well, think of it this way. If Jesus is Lord of creation, he's the one in whom all things hold together. And we, the church, are his body. That means we're his hands and his feet. And we are to live out that lordship of Jesus in how we treat the rest of creation for his sake, not just for ours. And then God's final intervention is still to come. When Jesus returns, not to destroy, but to judge and renew so that all things might be renewed in him. The Bible talks about creation longing to be set free from its bondage to decay. And so my next slide just gives two simple concepts that kind of sum this big picture up. One's from the Old Testament, the idea of shalom, which is about restored relationships with God, our neighbors, and creation. Peace throughout the created order. And in the New Testament, the kingdom of God. God's rule in every dimension. God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And so as we see the mess that there is there in our world today, with pollution and climate change and biodiversity loss, as we see what God's word says things should be like, then, next slide, I don't know about you, 
but it makes me want to lament. It makes me weep when I see what we've done. I took this photo of myself and my youngest daughter out on a cycle ride in that first lockdown. And we live uh, just on the edge of the M4 and under the flight path from Heathrow. And during that first lockdown, there wasn't a car in sight, there wasn't a vapor trail in the sky, the skies were blue, and we could actually hear skylarks singing. And that was wonderful, but my heart wept as I thought, why isn't it like this all the time? And the next slide. This is a graph of biodiversity loss. And during my lifetime, we've lost 70% of the world's wildlife populations. That makes me weep, and I believe it makes God weep too. So we need to see what's really going on. But secondly, we need to choose. Next slide. And there's a phrase that's been thrown around an awful lot in the last year, build back better. It's kind of been hijacked by politicians of all flavors for their own ends. But there is a biblical vision of building back better. And the next slide just gives us a flavor of that. I haven't time to go into it in detail, but I encourage you to have a look at Jeremiah 29 uh, at home later. Because it's a vision of God's purposes, of shalom, of his kingdom, in every dimension. And I've color coded it there. So you've got the ecological, planting gardens and eating what they produce. You've got the social, have families, invest in the future. You've got the economic and the political, the peace and prosperity of the city. You've got the spiritual, pray for it. It's a wonderful example of how we can build back better, even in our urban cities. And my next slide also carries on with this idea of what kind of world we should have, because this slide is about our place as humans in God's world. And three contrasting images. The one that has shaped the way our world is today is that first one. Humans at the top of the pile, nature for people. We can use and abuse it as we like. And sadly, even some Christians have taken being made in the image of God to excuse the abuse and exploitation of nature. But that's not what being made in God's image is about. It's about caring for creation, not dis destroying it. And the second image is of human beings just as one amongst the many species, no more important than any other. But the danger with that image is that if we become the virus species, the one that's wrecking the rest of it, then nature will be better off without us. And so I believe that the biblical vision is that third picture there. God so loved the world. Humans there, not because we're the least important at the bottom, but because we're there to uphold the rest of creation, to care for it for God's sake. We are a keystone species, to use an ecological term. We heard the story of Joseph in our children's ministry just earlier. And when Joseph looked after Egypt during those seven years of famine, he was doing exactly what we need to do when faced with climate injustice. We need to share from the goods that we have stored up so that those in need have enough to live on. So I want to leave you with four virtues from the Bible that I believe we need to work on. You know, virtues are like muscles. You only grow them as you use them. And the first virtue I want to look at is wonder. You exercise that by going out and playing with snow today. You exercise that by going for a walk along the canal, by finding a park, by noticing the birds in your garden, by reawakening that childlike wonder that we're all born with. The second virtue is humility, recognizing what a mess we've made and how we need to learn from nature. In the Bible, time and again, God tells people to look at the birds, to look at the animals, to look at the plants. In this verse, to look at storks who know when to migrate, even when God's people don't know how to behave. And then the third virtue that we need to work on is simplicity. To recognize that lockdown isn't a time for loads of online shopping. That's not going to make you happy. That we need less stuff, but maybe better stuff. We need to detox from the materialism that clogs our spiritual arteries. And then the fourth virtue is that of hope. Hope is a fact of future truth because it's based on the promises and character of God.
And that famous verse from Jeremiah 29 follows on from the passage that we looked at just earlier in Jeremiah 29. That promise of a hope and a future is about rebuilding, building back better in the world that God has given us. So a time to see, a time to choose, and then last, a time to act. If we are the body of Christ, then we need to act this year. And loads of Christian organizations, Arosha, Tear Fund, many others, have joined together to promote Climate Sunday, a time to really focus on this. There are great resources online. And there's a climate emergency toolkit encouraging churches to declare a climate emergency. That's something that we can do. And then we can act locally and tangibly. Between the lockdowns, our local church down the road on the edge of Southall went out and joined others in collecting litter that people had dumped when they were out enjoying their exercise. And it was a small thing to bless our community and to care for creation. And yet we found it's given us lots of new relationships with people in our local area. And then as we act locally and tangibly, we need to look at our buildings, at how we heat them, at how we light them, at how we can work towards net zero. And I really commend Eco Church. Uh, that's the next slide there which is a great project run by Arusha UK that more than 3,000 churches in England and Wales have now signed up to. And then as we lift our eyes to the global situation, getting involved in planning for that COP conference in Glasgow, but also rejoicing in what Christians around the world are doing. And if you get a chance, look at Arusha's website as we work in more than 20 countries, writing the gospel in the landscape, helping people in local communities, care for God's creation in practical ways. And so now my last slide. As we pray the Lord's Prayer, we pray for God's kingdom to be earthed, for it to come on earth as it is in heaven. And I really love this phrase that somebody shared with me last year. Unless we all flourish, no one can flourish. Climate injustice affects the poorest, the worst. And yet they've done least to cause the problems. Unless we all flourish, no one can flourish. What we're doing to the environment is destroying our fellow creatures that God made very good. Unless we all flourish, no one can flourish. And so as the worship group return, I want to just spend a moment or two encouraging you to pray to ask God what you should be doing in response to this. It may be that God's encouraging you to join the sustainability interest group here at St. Paul's. It may God be God is challenging you to do something about your own lifestyle, your habits. We're gonna be singing in a moment, I will offer up my life. And let's make that a prayer. I will offer up my life I will offer up my lifestyle. I will offer up my shopping. I will offer up my money. I will offer up my decisions to you, Lord, because it's your world and you care about how we treat it. You groan with the groaning of creation and you call us to work with you for the renewal of your world. Amen.